Good morning everyone. My name is Sarah Doherty and I'm the Marketing and Event Coordinator here at Hornbill. I'd like to welcome and thank you for jo joining today's webinar where we will be having a presentation on simplifying the challenges of modern ITSM with Stephen Boardman, Product Manager, and Stuart McCready, Senior Sector Manager here at Hornbill. Just to inform you, Delegate Auto will be muted during the presentation to help facilitate flow and timekeeping. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the GoToMeeting question facility on the right-hand side of your screen. We will collate questions and answer them at the end of the presentation. Thank you for taking the time to attend. I will now pass you over to Stephen and Stuart. Thanks, Sarah. Good morning. Uh, my name is Stuart McCready. I'm one of the sector managers in Hornbill, and I'm going to take you through some uh, background to the Simplifying the Challenges of Modern ITSM webinar. So, moving forward, um, effectively, get the right thing here. Here we go. So, um, We've been around in ITSM business for way over 20 years and um, we've identified some challenges coming from um, implementing some of the modern techniques within ITSM and, and again, some of the traditional tools that, that, that are out there. So we've, we've learned something from that, but we've also asked a lot of our customers and people in the marketplace about some of the challenges they've faced with, with traditional um, ITSM systems. <clears throat> and some of the things we came up with were around the ability to do upgrades and things like that. Now, upgrades are often expensive, um, time-consuming. People sometimes don't have the inclination or the time to do it. Um, that ends up with a situation where the longer you leave these upgrades uh, that you're entitled to on support, the, the bigger the gap becomes between where you are and what the actual product's going to give you potentially. So um, that tends to lead to things like customization required when it might not have been done uh, and the longer you leave things the more customization you may need uh, any toolkit customization is inevitable because nothing out of the box is ever going to be 100 percent fit just some are a better fit than others and then obviously the more you customize a solution the harder it becomes to support and upgrade that so it's a kind of double-edged sword you, you miss out on upgrades the, the more upgrades you do the less customizations and vice versa and when you do do an upgrade, typically what we found is that customizations often need to be reapplied, which is, again, time consuming for no good reason. Additionally, um, <clears throat> complexity in, in traditional systems mean that, you know, a high degree of knowledge and training is required by sort of system experts or product champions within in a business. Um, that training is time consuming, it's costly. Um, and sometimes that's things that get foregone and, and there's no in-house expert residing anywhere. So, you know, this is all adding up to being a traditionally complicated environment um, if you take all these things into account. Also, whilst the solution is powerful, traditionally some of the, um, let's say, legacy tools out there are not the most intuitive by today's standards. You know, people leaving university, the millennials, people that are used to using apps on their phone, people are used to following things and they're used to getting information pushed towards them. If you think of traditional tool sets that are out there, <clears throat> you have to go find that information. It's not the most intuitive tool to work with from an IT service management perspective. And traditionally, you have to go outside of the solution to communicate with your colleagues. So emails, knowledge is all outside the service desk tool. It's not in one place. Um, because that's all disparate, getting meaningful management information can sometimes be difficult as well. So these are some of the challenges that we've discovered and people have told us about. And if you take all of these things together, they all add up to one certainty. Uh, it's going to cost more money. So the, the, the total cost of ownership will drive up. Um, everybody's trying to get better productivity and deliver a better service. But if you look at some of the things we've just mentioned, it's all going to cost you more to do it. And, and it's a hidden cost. You don't necessarily know what you're going to be in for at the end of the day to, to actually have to, to outgo. So moving on from that, we thought, right, great. Let's, let's try and have a think about how we do things. And <clears throat> yes, it could have been a light bulb moment, but there was a lot of expertise gone into this. There's a lot of background and, We've built the, the Hornbill platform, as we call it now, around a very powerful, but yet a very simple idea. 
And if you look at the, the tools that you're used to, sorts of, you know, the Twitters, the Facebook, the Instagrams of this world, they're pushing information to you. You're getting this on your phone. You're getting it on any device. But you don't have to go looking for that. This is an example of the news feed in, in, in Hornbill Service Manager about information that's coming to you based on the role that you have in the business. So, again, there's a great big change straight away. The other change is that Hornbill is, is based on a platform. Um, it's a collaborative platform. And the idea is that you then download the apps that you want or you need uh, to do your ITSM job, uh, whether that's a, a management role or a, an analyst role. So you've got the ability to download things like Service Manager, Document Manager, Configuration Manager, and these are all sitting in the cloud and you subscribe to them to use them to do the, the, the job that you need them to do. And Steve will show you some of this, or most of it actually, in, in the demo as, as we go forward. But the idea, this is sitting on a whole cloud platform that you subscribe to. <clears throat> so that's partly some innovation. The rest of the innovation comes with potentially how you access it and, and where you access it. Um, so effectively, the idea here is that going right to left, just for a change, you can work anywhere. And uh, you can collaborate between yourselves as analysts and agents anywhere in the world. And you can hopefully share knowledge and ideas that are inside this tool rather than being outside the tool and emails or documents that I mentioned earlier. And the, the goal of that, obviously, is to boost productivity, not only for yourselves, but to be able to solve customer issues quicker, more efficiently um, as, you, as you move forward. How do we access it? Well, it's web only. Um, <clears throat> you can access it in any time zone. Um, it can be accessed via tablets, via an app on your phone, and we support iOS or Android native apps, uh, or through a browser anywhere on a screen. So again, whether that's a browser on an app, uh, sorry, on, on, on a tablet, on a phone, or, or indeed at your desk. But the apps are supported on these two tablets and, and phones as well. So any app access anywhere in the world and in fact in any language. So it supports multiple languages, which means that you as an analyst or an agent can be working in your native language, in your home country, and that will automatically translate using Google Translate so that people in different time zones and different languages can actually benefit from the knowledge that's been posted in the different language. So anywhere in the world, any language, any device. So there's also a concept within not just Service Manager, but within any kind of tool set of tacit knowledge and explicit knowledge. Now, tacit knowledge is, is the, the stuff, I'll call it, that people share with each other. You, I might ask Steve, how do I do this in NetSuite? He'll say, well, you log into XYZ and you change this option. That's tacit knowledge that, that might get lost outside a tool. <clears throat> what you'll see within here is that when we look at the workspaces and, and how the collaboration works, that that information will be captured automatically in the tool if, if we do so, and other people can learn from that as well. And then you've got the explicit knowledge, which would be like your traditional knowledge base, document management within there, so we can upload documents, share them with different people in different libraries. So the whole thing is basically one big knowledge base. It's just about how you capture that information. And again, this will come out in the demo. So the other, the other big difference is that this is this is a true service. This is this is not an on-premise solution. So it's not the concept of buying a piece of software that gets delivered on a CD and you stick it on the server and everybody lives happily ever after. Um, this is a true service that, that we actually manage for you. It's continuously deployed, which means it's a, a, a proper SaaS environment with continuously deployed updates. So the thing here is that none of this costly upgrades that you pay for on your annual support and maintenance contract that you perhaps never up upload or never take. So you're not paying for them because you're always going to be there. So what that means is you don't have to, what's the word, plan for an upgrade. It just happens. We do that. They're all automatic. What that means for you is that you're always up to date on the latest version. Just like you might be on, on an app on your phone, you're always going to be on the latest one that downloads on your chosen time um, zone and away you go. So you're up to date with the latest features, no service disruption for you. Don't have to take the test server down, upload it, do anything with that. And any customizations that you make keep on working as well. 
So really, we manage the whole back end and you get on with your day job and actually carry on supporting your customers. So enough of that for now. Um, that's all very good in theory. I'm going to pass over to Steve now to, to show you the product in action and I'll be back later just to, to summarise. Thanks. Thanks, Stuart, and good morning, everyone. So as Stuart said, we're going to have a look at some of the functional capabilities of Service Manager, mm -hmm. and then I shall pass back to Stuart just to sort of wrap up again on uh, some of the other benefits or differences that Hornbill can make outside of the functionality. So what we'll have a look at today is the end user experience, your customer's experience when they're using Service Manager. We'll have a look at um, an analyst view or someone that's a service delivery manager, change manager, that type of view. Um, but we'll also have a look at some of the output you can get from Service Manager in terms of advanced analytics as well. But what we're presented with here initially is the self-service portal. And it's important here just to, again, to reiterate some of Stuart's points, that the self-service portal is available uh, in any language. It supports transparent single sign-on. You can customize and brand this codelessly through our admin tool. Every customer or every end user that's using the self-service portal will get a different or tailored experience based on the services that they're subscribed to and whether those services are provided internally, externally, whether they're provided by IT, by HR facilities, etc. These will all be served up for a single portal and only the services you're subscribed to are the ones you'll see. The information that you can see going across on the carousel is based on bulletins and news relevant to the services of the user that's subscribed. So users aren't getting hit with information they're not interested in. What you'll notice across the bar across the centre here is that the user can favoritise their services. They can look at all the services that are provided by all the different service providers within their business. They can see where they've got active services and they can also look at where services may have been marked as impacted or maybe um, offline um, at any point. So if we take a, a real example here where we've got a customer working from home, he can't access the corporate uh, network, so he's got an issue with his VPN. So he can come onto a self-service portal, look for his impacted services, see that his home working service is impacted, and drill down further into the information <clears throat> to see if there's any way that he can actually self-help so he doesn't actually have to engage with the service desk at all. Now the first option here we could see is if there are actually <clears throat> any known issues. What those known issues were, and if any workaround information have been presented. So here we can see there is a known issue and there is workaround information. So Steve could go ahead and try and um, <clears throat> use that to try and solve his issue. But if we take a scenario where, in fact, there wasn't any workaround information available, we were just aware of an issue that had been reported. The quickest and easiest way for Steve on this occasion to let the service desk know, let the problem management team know that he's also impacted by this, is simply selecting the Me Too option. Now, this is going to add him to that existing request. It's going to notify the team that he is impacted. And most importantly, it's going to add Steve onto the communication chain going forward for when that workaround becomes available or when the ultimate fix is, is, uh, is found. What it also means is that Steve doesn't have to log repeat incidents and the problem team don't have to go looking for those repeat incidents and link them up to that problem or known error record. But if there weren't any known issues, is there any other knowledge or information that's been pushed out relating to his homework and that might again allow Steve to self-help? Now that knowledge could be in the form of um, uh, embedded media, it could be videos, it could be images, it could be hyperlinks to other content. It could also just be as simple as embedded images or just text and structural information. But the key thing here is understanding actually what the, um, what the users of those services need and how we can reduce those repeat calls for the same things by actually pushing out those FAQs or that knowledge to them. But in this scenario, if there were no, no knowledge, no known issues available, how does Steve go about reporting the issue? And here we can introduce the request catalogue. And the request catalogue gives you the option to define the options that are available per service that those subscribed users can consume. It could be as simple as just saying, I want to schedule a call back with the relevant team that are going to be able to help me. Or it might be that actually Steve might be new to the business and he hasn't actually set the VPN software up in the first place, so we might want to schedule that in. But if Steve simply wanted to let the team know that he was having an issue, he can follow this option, which brings us into our progressive capture. And this is just a simple way to ask the relevant questions, uh, branch questions, to capture the relevant information and get this routed to the resolver team in the quickest time. So we're just going to put here, unable to connect. We then might be prompted to associate one or multiple of Steve's CIs or assets that we know he's got a relationship to. And I'm then going to go ahead, 
click on finish and raise that and have that routed automatically to the correct resolver team. Now on doing so, Steve will have clear visibility about the fulfillment process that that team are going to go through to resolve his issue. He can use the heads up display here to see the steps and stages that will be followed, what's happened so far and what needs to happen next. It's very, very simple and clear for Steve to see. Now that was really a simple example where um, I knew where to navigate to, to to log that request or look for helpful information. But in reality, any business is going to offer tens or hundreds of different services. And it's really un unrealistic to expect all the end users to, to know where to start or where to go for particular issues. So this is where we've introduced our federated search, which will allow the users just to come in here and simply type what they're looking for. And this will again return the results which there should be of interest. So any known issues, any FAQs that might help them to, to self-help or where they need to go to actually report these issues. And if we switch that up and have a look at another example, I might be looking to order a new corporate mobile. I can come in here and again, I can see knowledge and FAQs relating to the company policies for those new mobiles. And I can see where I need to go to request a new mobile. And it will drop me back into the relevant progressive capture that I need, provide the information and we'll get that process kicked off. So that's all, all great from an end user's point of view, but how do we actually go about facilitating providing those services as a service provider. So I've just come back into the user app and we can he see here at the top that um, instant that we just raised for that issue has been logged and it's been routed to my team. So I can pick up my notification through the browser or I can pick it up through the native iOS and Android apps that Stuart mentioned earlier. So I should always be kept informed about uh, new tickets and updates to those tickets. But if we come down and have a look at the services which underpin what we saw on the portal, here we can see our home working service, and we can see all the things I'm sure you're expecting to see at this point. We can see the portfolio lifecycle of that particular service, and we can see it's in catalogue, which is why it was on the portal. We can see who's subscribed to that service and therefore can make those requests, see the knowledge, see the known issues, see the bulletins that relate to it. We can subscribe people on multiple different groupings. We can see who's supporting that service, and this is important when we think about who we can assign these requests logged against the service to, but equally, who has the rights to see the requests logged against this service? This is all important. Ownership. Where do we go to build the bulletins that we saw on the portal? How can we see and build the FAQs and get some feedback in terms of which ones are being accessed? We can look at the request configuration and actually define those request catalog items that we want to promote and offer out. We can do things like form design, add fields, make fields mandatory. All of that is configurable easily here. We could also look at actually what does it take to actually enable us to provide that service in the first place? What infrastructure, what hardware, what software underpins our ability to actually publish this service out? If we wanted to explore that more graphically, we can have a look at the service. And we can look at that not only in terms of the infrastructure, but requests, users, and documents that support that service. I can reduce the noise down by just hiding the request there. And now we can start to have a look at actually what is the hardware and software, which CIs uh, or our end users' laptops or desktops are linked to that. What are the bi-directional relationships that have been formed and what are the impact levels that we've set against those if one happens to be um, degraded or impacted? So all of that is available to us. If we come back up though and have a look at a perhaps more familiar view here, this is introducing ourselves to the, re the request list. And there's some really key can concepts which I'll introduce, but just before I do so, this is a good example where, um, as we're providing this service to you, we're providing you in-app education and training to your users about the new features. So as we continuously deploy, and if we add a new feature in, we're going to let you know about it here. And we can even read more on it, and it might include a video or a link to our wiki, but it just keeps you informed. But coming back to this request list, this is context sensitive, and we'll only show Graham what he's entitled to see. So Graham here has the rights to work with incidents, service request problems, etc. If he didn't, and he didn't have the rights to work with change, that icon wouldn't be visible. He's got the rights to look at requests that he's working on himself, ones he's following or where he's been added. But also, if he's a member of multiple teams, he can look at tickets that belong to just one of his teams, or he can look at uh, all the tickets belong to any of the teams that he's a member of, and also any ticket of any type. And we can see this denoted on the left-hand side. If Graham's quickly looking for information and he wants to see anything that was VPN-related, he can use this multifunctional search on the left-hand side. If he was interested in what his colleague Brian was working on at a particular time, he can use the same filter. And if he happened to be on the phone to a particular customer and wants to see their active tickets, he can also just put their details in here. But as well as providing those, if you like, out-of-the-box options, 
each analyst has the ability to come in and build their own views and work how they want to work. So here I've created a number of personal views and I've had views shared with me. But this particular view here, the high priority instant view, the analyst doesn't need to have any technical or deep understanding of the back end data structure or database tables. He simply gets presented with a clause builder to say, well, I want a high priority instant view, so I just need to pick the relevant priority, the relevant status and type. And if I wanted to make that uh, relevant just to a particular service I'm interested in, they're just simple selections here that I can go down and make those choices from. But once I've got those views in place, it also then affords me the ability to create charts and content for my own personal dashboards. And here I might say that actually I'm interested in seeing which teams are looking after those high priority instances or which individuals in those teams are responsible. I might want to see which sites are impacted or maybe I want to have a look at actually as well as the sites, which individual customers are impacted by this. So I might go ahead and create a new view on that and we might want to preview that chart. Now we can see that it uh, looks like Steve and Steve have got a few and Anna's impacted by these as well. If we save that, that's then going to be available on our personal dashboard. And if we so desired, we might want to share that view with colleagues or um, co-workers. But what it then affords me is the ability from my request list view to quickly toggle between my list and my personal dashboard view. And because it is my personal dashboard, I can move things around. I can remove them from there. I can drill down into any of that underlying data that's in those dashboards to get back to the requests. So I can drill into those requests. And if I so desire, I can export all that information out, taking the data I want with me to CSV. That moves us quite nicely on to looking, well, actually, okay, that's fine. We've seen self-service. We've seen where we can manage our requests. What are the other channels that we've got available to us? Well, there's three other options that you've got, the first of which is the ability to integrate with your corporate email services. So we can pull your mailboxes in here. So if you've got a support at company or multiple um, mailboxes, we can act as a viewer here, pull those emails in, and then give you an option to either review those emails and manually promote um, or raise a new ticket or add that to an existing ticket. Or using a rules builder, you can look for where the emails come from, i.e. the domain or the subject of the, um, sorry, the content of the subject or the body of the email. And if there's particular words, then we can raise a ticket automatically and route it to the correct resolver team without any manual uh, intervention. So cutting down on that triage significantly. The third option is that you can raise requests from third party tools. We have fully published XML APIs that allow you to invoke those APIs and raise tickets as if you were doing this manually through the, um, the UI. And the fourth option is coming in and raising the ticket manually if someone's walked in or they've phoned in. But just before I raise that ticket manually and show the analyst view, there's two really key concepts that underpin how Service Manager works. And the first of that is through our business processes. So this is all about the fulfillment once a request has been received. Now, out of the box, we do ship with example instant problem, change, service request um, processes, as I'm sure you'd expect. But you've also got the ability for you to come in and create your own. Now, these are all built using our um, graphical drag and drop canvas. So it's nice and easy for you to come in and build the, the, the logic and, and workflow that you need. Another key tenant here is that it should be non-prescriptive. We shouldn't, you, you shouldn't have to change your processes to fit this particular tool. If we take a quick example of where you might want to be using service level management on your instant process, for argument's sake, uh, and you might be interested in just using the response time. Well, in service management, you can build that in your business process. You can decide if it's a fixed and a response timer that you want to use. If it was just a response timer, you can also choose when that timer should start and what constitutes it being achieved. None of that is hard coded. It's all available for you to define. You can also come in here and define multiple stages to your processes. You can look at things like automated actions like assignments and round robin capacity based assignments, the sending of automatic emails at particular trigger points, manual tasks and whether they're assigned to individual groups or roles, authorizations and the waiting for those authorizations, decisions, <clears throat> suspend actions and a variety of other outcomes are all available and definable here. And the beauty of this is all of the maturity and uh, power here is all hidden then from your end user via our graphical heads up display and equally from your analyst community that will be working through the requests again behind that graphical heads up display. So that's really about the fulfillment side but also that logging experience that we're going to um, offer here. This is trying to move away from the challenges that we've seen with traditional this legacy um, service management solutions where 
if you open up a cool logging form, it sometimes looks a little bit like um, spreadsheets on steroids where you're just presented with loads and loads of fields and depending on what you're logging, you have to fill in fields A, B and C and it's E, D and F on, on another occasion. It's very difficult to actually get people up to speed quickly and easily on that. And it's very, very different to what you're actually used to in your consumer life. Now, if you went online to book a holiday or buy insurance and you go to any of these websites, you're simply guided through a process of providing the information, what you're looking for, and based on the decisions and the in inputs you, put, you, you, you provide, it will guide you through the rest of the data collection. At the end of it, you've either booked your holiday or you've got your car insurance sorted out. Now, this tool provides you with exactly the same capabilities. You can build the questions that you want to ask, and depending on the outcomes to the questions, it will branch and ask related questions. So if I'm asking about a desktop support issue and it's an instant, I'm going to ask you for the category, the priority, and the asset details. However, if you happen to be calling up about a finance issue, I might have a list of specific custom questions that I want to present to you. All of this is available for you to build um, graphically and easily. So what does that look like? Well, if we come back and go to raise a request manually, I could come in and say I'm on the phone and I want to raise an instant or a service request. But typically what we've, we've heard and what we've seen is that actually we don't know that it's an instant or a service request or a change until we've actually taken some key information from the caller. So to do that, we introduce our raise new option where we're simply going to be guided through those questions. We're going to say, okay, well, I'm speaking to Steve. Is it the right person? Are they calling about an existing one of their tickets and they just want an update? If they are, fantastic. I'll give them the update and I'll move on. If not, what are they calling about? What services do they take from us? And again, we can see another example of a new feature that was dropped in there. Now, if it was something like Mac support and we had some defined catalog items, as the analyst, I can quickly choose the relevant one and negate the need to ask lots of questions. However, if it was more generic, maybe it's something like desktop support, it might guide, guide me through and actually provide the information. Let's capture this VPN issue. So we'll follow the same thread. So unable uh, to connect. Now, now I know who I'm speaking to, which service it relates to and the information I've gathered. It's probably quite logical that this is going to be logged as an instance, so I can select the relevant choice. And on doing so, it then goes through that progressive capture and will ask me the relevant questions related to the route that I've followed. Now I'm going to go down here and I'm going to choose that it's also affecting my uh, laptop, maybe my iMac. I'll go ahead and raise that into the system. Now on doing so, the business process takes care of the routing. It takes care of automated email notifications with my reference number. And we can see this reflected by the heads up display at the top. An email has been sent. It's been routed to the relevant team. The priority was picked up when we were doing that in progressive capture. A time was kicked off here, but it's just a, a resolution time and no response one. We're not interested in that. What it's also done is taken me in context on the action bar to where I need to perform the next action, which on this occasion is actually a member of the team to come in and take ownership. So as Graham, I'm going to go and pick that particular request up. Now on doing so, that checkpoint has been achieved. We move on to the next stage. And in this example, it's actually created a task for someone to look into the issue, whether it be the owner, a named individual, a role, or a group. The options are entirely up to you. Now, I'm not going to run through all of the various options you've got available today, but needless to say, I can provide textual updates. I can make those customer or team facing. I could, if I wanted to, cut and paste and take a screenshot of the, the error, and I can just drop that in here. So I'm going to put that in <coughs> the error, and I'll apply that in there. That then drops into the timeline, which is your audit trail. It's all in line. It's very visual. I can see what's happened without having to open every, every single update. You can do all the things I'm sure you're expecting. You can schedule callbacks. You can drag and drop multiple attachments in. You can send emails, change the customers, cancel, etc., etc. What you can also do, though, is look for related tickets. So if I wanted to see if there's any other VPN-related um, tickets in there, I can see, in fact, there's 30. Far too many for me to look through. So let's narrow that down and say, well, let's just look for problems that are still open that are VPN-related. Great. One, one problem that's there, the same one that we saw in the portal. Now, if I choose to link my request to that particular change, sorry, to this particular problem, and that problem had a workaround, that solution or potential solution gets cascaded down to me. And as an instant owner, I can choose to accept or reject that particular, particular solution and whether it helps my customer out. One of the other options that I've got from here is actually raising link requests. But just before I do, there's a couple of collaborative aspects, again, that we need to introduce here. First and foremost, do I want to follow this ticket? And by following it, in the same way as using Facebook or similar tools, it's going to push me updates that are, uh, that are added to this request onto my timeline. So any of the tickets I'm following, I'm going to see the updates without actually having to come into those tickets. 
Now, I can also work in a traditional manner where I could work on this ticket until I've done all I can, and then I could assign it away. Or I could create an activity for another team or individual to come in and help out on this ticket. But what we've also done here is actually complemented that by giving you the ability just to drop in those subject matter experts as and when you need them. So I can retain ownership of this ticket, but I can invite Rosemary in. Now, by inviting Rosemary in, maybe she doesn't have the rights to look at my team's calls normally or have the rights to look at incidents because she's the change manager. We can elevate her rights just for this ticket and we could get her to, to come in and provide the assistance. How can we let Rosemary know what assistance is needed? Well, I can come in here and I can mention Rosemary. I can see whether she's online or whether she's offline, but she'll pick up her notification through the browser or through the native um, apps that Stuart mentioned. So I'm just going to put here, Rosemary, uh, please, can you advise? And here, that notification we pushed out to, to Rosemary, and she'll get that targeted communication. But coming back then, let's have a look at um, just jumping up quickly to raise a instant prompt or change off the back of this. We'll raise a change. We'll keep the details the same. We'll log in against the same service. We'll make some choices. We'll say it's a standard change. It's affecting multiple users. But in fact, in my opinion, the risk is relatively low. I could add assets if I wanted to, but I'm not going to on this occasion. Now, on doing so, when that change is raised, obviously, we can have different prefixes for tickets if we want. But we're then into a different fulfillment um, process here. And we can see again that I might be prompted to take ownership of this particular change. And on doing so, it moves on. And it's now pushing this to the change team to say, actually, now it's been created. Do you want to validate that it's worth looking at? So I can say, looks, uh, looks OK, worth, worth investigating. Good spell, worth investigating. And here I can choose from the definable outcomes that you can set. I can also record time spent, and I can push that time into our other productivity apps like our timesheet uh, app, I'm going to look at it in a second. But on doing so, that um, brings up an impact assessment and we're on to the next planning stage, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go through all of those, but it was just really to get us into the point where I can actually introduce our visual boards. And the reason I wanted to introduce these was it's all well and good having 30 or 40 change requests in flight at any given time. But if you're the change manager, you probably want an, over, an overview of actually where do those changes sit in the life cycle stages of your change fulfillment process at any given time. So here I've got our visual board, which is breaking that change process down into its incoming assess and with CAB approved in progress stages. And we can see all the changes that are waiting for that validation, those that have been validated that are waiting for assessment and those that have made it across to CAB and further and are now actually being implemented. It's a real time bird's eye view because our business process will automate the movement of these request cards from stage to stage without the need for any manual intervention. Now, it's not just change that this can be used for. You could use it if you, uh, uh, if you had a procurement process with completely different uh, lifecycle stages you're interested in. And the same could be true from a development point of view if you're managing development requests. Again, we can look at the, the changes this way. Or in fact, if you uh, were interested in instant management and you had escalations running against your service levels, and these were sending off email notifications and reassignments as you got closer to your targets. You can also have them promoted onto breach boards, which is going to give you a very visual indicator of which ones are at risk or have, in fact, breached at any given time. Okay. <clears throat> but if we take all that in mind and then come back to the underlying theme, which Stuart's referring to here, which was about collaborative service management, and I'm going to come back up to my uh, news feed here. This is all about, as I mentioned, information being presented to you around topics that are of interest to you. So we can see that request that we're following and all the updates that have been applied. We can see as we go further down uh, changes that, have, that are ongoing that have been published out. We can see documents that have been uh, shared with an individual. We can see uh, major incidents, problems, etc. All of that information is being presented. Now, we know for a fact already that we're getting the information about incidents because we're following that ticket. But we're getting information about change management and about problem management and major incidents because we happen to be a member of a workspace. Now, these workspaces are just topics for you to come in and either discuss content, in this case, changes, or to allow notifications to be automatically pushed out to the members of those workspaces. And we can use it for that purpose, or we could use it to provide our users with a forum where they can come in and they can post information, they can um, update comments, they can ask questions. And this would be a good example where we've got our first line FAQs, where we could perhaps invite the first line team, the second line team, our app specialists all into this workspace and we can ask each analyst to come in and ask the questions or the challenges that their customers are, 
are feeding back to them. And they can see where their colleagues can provide answers in their local languages. And here Graham work in English can translate that into his local language, see what the answer is, and then also see which of his colleagues have validated that answer by voting for them. And he can have confidence to use that answer when he goes back to his customer. Now this is all about the tacit knowledge that Stuart mentioned uh, in an introduction. And it's about the knowledge that all this type of engagement that might happen by the coffee machine or the water machine or might be exchanged via email. Yes, in both cases, that will get the answer there and then. But by capturing and tracking that information on the platform, that information is there forevermore and can be reused. So if I was using the global search at the top and I wanted to look for anything that was Shrewsoft related, our VPN software, I can go in and I can see all the relevance related results. I could look at anything that was just posted in the last month or, or six months since we've done an upgrade. I could look at stuff that Stuart's posted because I know he's our uh, networks expert. Or I could simply re restrict those results to a particular workspace and search again. Again, I'll find a relevance-based question. I can see an answer provided by Brian and that Daniel, Pablo and Pierre have all voted for that and said it's a good answer. So I can have confidence that I can use that, uh, that information. But we also don't um, uh, dismiss the need at all for that more explicit or structured knowledge. And here, you know, we might want to find our change management process. So I can drop into our document manager app. And this gives us an example of a document, who it's been shared with, full revision histories that are being kept, tags that allow us to search but also arrange self-organizing collections, activities relating to that document, and a timeline which gives you all the information relating to the content of that particular document that's being discussed. Now, Document Manager, which we're looking at here, or our Timesheet Manager app where we're pushing information in from Service Manager, or even our Customer Manager app, are just other examples of line of business applications that are deployed on that collaborative platform alongside Service Manager. The key thing here, though, is that all of the activities, regardless of the app that they come from, are all presented either through our sidebar here or through your activities view, where you can organize activities that relate to the different teams that you belong to. So if you're a manager, you can look at direct reports. And you can look at these in configurable boards again. You can look at them in list views or calendar views of that information. Now, with all that in mind, all that information you're gathering, it's really important to make sure that you can get some useful uh, uh, stats and uh, analytics out of the, the, the back end. So alongside those um, role-based dashboards that we looked at earlier, we can also introduce our analytics options. And here the platform is provided with a trending engine that will allow you to build up measures, you know, define things such as average time to resolve or how many uh, instants are you logging on a daily basis. Perhaps more importantly, how many are resolving on a weekly or a monthly basis. You can set targets for those measures and then see how you're performing daily, weekly, monthly against those targets. How is it trending and how does that line look? Once we've got those measures um, up and running and collating that data in the background, we can build widgets. And those widgets can be based on the measures, or they could just be traditional charts or lists or counters. We can then put those widgets onto dashboards. We can share those dashboards with individual roles or groups. Those dashboards can be wallboarded. Or what we could also do is daisy chain multiple dashboards together to allow you to present lots of data very quickly on these big screens. And this is just a very quick and easy way to demonstrate the type of output that you can expect or you can get from those widgets uh, using Service Manager. So whether it's very visual, whether it's relating to knowledge um, and what searches people are using on the self service portal, month on month, year on year trends, uh, which knowledge articles are being looked at or not looked at, what search terms are people actually looking for, so what knowledge do we need to create, and how we're performing against our service level targets. All of that is easily created using the analytics package. So at this point, I'm just going to pass you back to Stuart, and he's just going to summarize some of those functional and non-functional benefits of working with Formula. Thanks very much, Steve. Very comprehensive. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, um, moving on from that then, I hope you all enjoyed that excellent presentation. Why, why Hornbill then? Well, we've got three key uh, things that we live by. Uh, one of them um, is customer first, and that's not just something we say, it's something that we actually do, because the vast majority of everything that you've seen in that tool has not only come from what we did with support works, but based on customer feedback as well. Um, there's various support plans that we offer for our customers, and uh, you know, hopefully, when you we, when you become one, you might you might actually agree that customers do come first, so that's good. Um, secondly, um, partnership through collaboration. We we use our own tool, so we collaborate well internally, but we also collaborate well with our customers. 
and, and as I've alluded to anyway, a lot of what you've just seen has come through the partnership with our customers and what they might want to see and what they might not want to see. Um, and finally, really everything's about quality, not compromise. We deploy this on a continuous basis, as we said earlier. Um, everything's quality driven, everything's delivered in a quality way, and hopefully from what you've seen through the tool set that you can see that it does look like a quality product. So we don't compromise. We've uh, got very rigid uh, quality processes that we go through as well. So that's three good reasons from a kind of company perspective as to, to why um, we live by these rules. Um, over and above that, we've kind of turned the implementation side of things on its head. Now, you've probably all come from a traditional background of on-premise where as I said earlier, you get the CD, you install it, we have a minimum of five days on site to do X, Y, Z, and you need a lot of input from your end, and we need a lot of consultancy time from our end. Totally change that. We basically give you 30 days proof of concept, that's what that says, and, and you've got the ability to, to be 100% guaranteed, satisfied before you carry on. And, and so how do we do that? Um, we basically allow you to put us to the test. And we'll deliver effectively a 30-day free implementation for you. You can subscribe to that for 30 days, use it in earnest, not only in a, a demo environment, but we also provide the whole implementation. And you have access to 30 days of a product specialist from Hornbill who will work with you to do very standard stuff, but it's all documented in, in what we call a free switch on. It'll get your data in there, it'll get your asset in there. We'll work with you to basically put some processes in there. Effectively, to get to the point of a pre-production system, we'll also train your champions and your admin people free of charge. So effectively, what happens is throughout that 30 days, you go from a, a blank instance to a pre-production system that you could actually go live uh, and, and start using it. So the idea there is at the end of the 30 days, you have the choice. Yes, I can subscribe and start using the pre-production system in a live environment with all your data, because you've done the work anyway, at no charge. Or you can basically say, well, I quite like the idea, Stuart, but it's not for us at the moment. Um, and you can just walk away. So it'll be a virtual handshake, because uh, it's a cloud environment. And, and away you go. So, uh, you know, there is no risk on you as a customer whatsoever. So I think we're probably one of the only vendors out there actually doing that. And the fact that you've got 30 days free running of a, a solution plus 30 days of services effectively for nothing is a very key point, I would suggest. So not only can you do that, we, we have other good ticks in the boxes as well. So the difference that we feel that we deliver are fourfold. And I'm, I'm actually going to just put all this up in one go and, and talk through it. Top left, we've alluded to this already, you're not buying a piece of software that you manage, you're basically buying a service and you're subscribing to that service. So we manage the whole back end, we are doing all the updates for you, you don't need to do anything, any customizations that you make to the tool will carry on working forever and a day. You're always up to date with the latest feature. None of this taking the live system down at one in the morning or deploying tests to live, all of that goes away. The other thing from a commercial perspective is we basically give you a price for life. So yes, obviously you do pay to subscribe to this after you've gone through the 30-day trial, but like every other software business in the world, of course we reserve the right to increase our prices, but that doesn't mean that these price increases will be passed on to you because basically whichever cost or price you subscribe to, if you subscribe to the price plan tomorrow, that's the price you will pay forever as long as you remain a subscribed customer with no breaks. So effectively, that basically gives you discounts over time. So unlike some of the, the, the big boys in the business, and I'll mention the name service now, their goal is to kind of lock you in, and they will give you price increases year on year. You will never get a price increase from us. Uh, you will pay what you pay tomorrow, forever, effectively. We talked about training your admin people and your product champions through the 30-day um, proof of concept. Things change. These people leave the business. They get promoted. They may even get demoted. Who knows? They might end up doing a different role, but they might not be the product champion for service manager. So we recognize that it's better for us to have people trained in your business. So we'll commit to 
basically replace these people and train other people when these people do leave or get promoted or whatever. Uh, again, that's free of charge. So that's a trained for life scenario as well as a price for life. It's more cost effective for us to have someone trained in your organization than it is to field support calls from people with all due respect who probably don't know the product very well. And finally, um, for the contract related people amongst you, there's actually no contractual tie in. Um, we're basically giving you the ability to terminate um, if you wish. Um, again, we're not trying tying you into a two year contract, three year contract. Basically, we want happy customers, not contractually bound customers. So effectively, at any point in time, you can terminate for convenience and any unused subscriptions will be refunded from that point in time. So there's no penalty to, to walk away and all the monies will be refunded in full. So these are quite key things we feel and it is what makes us different, um, that with the free implementation. So quite a compelling offer, I would suggest. Um, the functionality is, is what you would get elsewhere for sure and we think it's better than what you get elsewhere because we've got the collaborative side as well. So when you put all this together it becomes quite a compelling proposition. Anyway, um, enough of that from me. How much does it actually cost? Well, it's actually a very simple plan. Um, it's a per month, per user subscription based on the number of users you have. So whether you've got a small team, a large team, a medium team, it starts off at £42.50 per user per month. And as you would imagine, the more people that subscribe, the cheaper that becomes per user per month. So very transparent, very simple. Um, there's no point in complicating these things. And, and that basically gives you everything that you've seen today in that per user per month subscription. Okay, so free implementation and then subscriptions. And that's all I was actually going to cover. Um, thanks, Steve, again for your demo perspective. Um, probably got some questions that have come through, I'm pretty sure. We've had a couple that, that we've seen coming through. Yeah, we have, sir. Um, been a couple here, so we'll just try and rattle through those as quickly as we can for you. Um, so we had a question being asked about, obviously, this being a cloud-based solution, uh, where are the data centers located? Maybe I'll take that one. Um, <clears throat> so depending on the region that you're in um, as a customer, so if you're in the, uh, the UK, then your uh, data will reside in the, in the EU, and that includes any backups on there. In fact, our, uh, our European uh, data centers are actually in the UK anyway. So no issue there. If you're a customer coming in in the States or in uh, Australasia, then there are obviously data centers in the various regions uh, that you are a customer in. Uh, we've also got a question um, here asked here about our assets and our user data. You mentioned those during the, the switch on and yeah, um, options yeah. for getting that data in. So again, just quickly on that, we do have various options for getting user and asset data in. Uh, you can obviously sit there and you can manually put that data in, which probably isn't an option. Uh, the second uh, choice. <laughs> it's you might an have. option. It's Not a great option. option. Uh, the second choice you've got is um, CSV imports uh, for both. So if you wanted to do that. Or the third option is actually having uh, scheduled um, uh, scheduled imports of that data, obviously do an initial one-off, but then have uh, looked for new and updates coming in on a scheduled basis. So both of those options um, are presented to you. There's a commercial one here, which again, Steve, I want to uh, pick up on here. Uh, you mentioned that it was 42.50 uh, per month per user. Yeah. Is that for analysts and end users, or how does that? Good question. Um, effectively, that's for agents, that's analysts, that's people working in resolver groups using the full um, client, if you like, that Steve showed them with, with the, the workload lists and the, and the ticketing lists. End users, customers, coming in through the self-service portal that Steve started off looking at, where they could log their own tickets and request services um, against the services they subscribe to, is, is completely free. So there's no cost for end user access via the portal. It's based on the per agent per user per month. Okay, fantastic. Okay. We've got one last question here that, that's come up. Uh, and again, I think this relates to some of the, the topics you were going through there. So you're asking about um, if there's new features or functions that uh, they might want as a, as a customer. Is there a mechanism or a uh, medium for them to be able to request those and get those into the product? Um, maybe I can take that one again. So um, absolutely, really, um, we have free streams that drive the, uh, the, the features that go into Service Manager. Uh, obviously, we have our own strategic object, um, objectives. Uh, we have the quality, which Stuart alluded to, and then we have our customer input. 
Now we've deliberately um, um, uh, set this up so that customers are not contractually bound going forward, as Stuart mentioned. Yeah. So unless we deliver not only the new features that, that our customers are asking for, uh, but also that it performs well, mm -hmm. it's innovative, and it has all the benefits that we talked about, customers are free to walk away at any time. So yeah. absolutely, we have a customer forum where we um, in positively encourage our customers to put their feature requests on there. Those things are then adopted, accepted, and rolled out into the product. And using our continuous deployment, no customer ever has to worry about taking an upgrade to leverage or take advantage of those features. They will just become available. Yeah. Um, as I say, we really sort of put ourselves uh, to the test doing that. Okay. Good. okay. That's it. I don't think there was any more questions, so I think that's, all. that's back to Sarah then. Thanks okay. very much. Thank you, Stuart and Stephen, for taking us through that presentation. I hope everyone found it useful. If you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to contact me or your relationship manager. Finally, thank you everyone for your time today. Goodbye.